All right, Breaker 1-9, we are online. Give everybody a second to kind of boot in here. Uh, as we get rolling, quick recap. Uh, so last week we went into just uh, regular airflow in terms of what, what I would consider light tonnage or what I referred to as low static in the heavy commercial space. So we're talking systems that run, you know, less than half an inch of, of external static, for example. Uh, that's not even our supply static side. Uh, so that was a heavy conversation last week and how our airflow is affected uh, or how our refrigerant side is affected by the airflow and how to calculate some of that air, some things to look for and pay attention to. This week, we're going to be diving into the more heavy side and we're going to see uh, what makes the heavy side function. So when I say the heavy side, you know, this is going to be true for basically anything about 50 to 60 tons and above. Um, now in that lower tonnage, you can still have um, uh, some just, well, anything of that nature is gonna be what I would call high static. Not, not, I'll preface again, I don't mean literally a high static system. A true high static system is operating at like two plus inches of static. Sometimes I think they can go as high as five, depending on the design. Uh, when I'm referencing a high static versus low static, I'm specifically pointing out, you know, we're running one inch of static or an inch and a half of static on the supply duct itself and versus our smaller equipment where those coils may only be running, uh, you know, half an inch of static uh, if they're running properly or ideally a high efficiency system would be even less than that. So I want to preface that as we get into this. Uh, and just a quick recap of last week. I think everybody's had a chance to get in here. So let's dive into CAV and a VAV. Uh, hello, everybody. I see y'all jumping in the chat. Uh, so a, a CAV is a constant air volume. So constant air volume is when we're move. the system is commissioned to move a set stream of air. So we could have a... Uh, an RTU, for example, set up this way. A 50, 60 ton RTU could very well be set up to where it's gonna run this set, uh, this set stream of air or the, the amount of air. So we consider uh, the volume, right, as in CFM. CFM is a way to calculate how much air is physically moving at a given time. So when that RTU gets commissioned, you know, it's, that RTU is going to run roughly around one inch of static once everything's commissioned properly. And that's something you do have to pay attention to. But in that process, uh, we're not going to have any other devices or anything else in the system that's going to fluctuate uh, how much air goes through that RTU. So it's going to be commissioned to run just that single set amount of air. You can also see this... Um, in what's known as like multi-zone systems. And so we'll dive into more of that as we go. So a VAV, a variable air volume versus constant, uh, that's gonna be a lot of your, uh, your larger tonnages, but the, the, short, the short, simple definition, the amount of CFM fluctuates. At one given time, we may be moving, you know, 60,000 60, CFM uh, down a specific uh, supply duct. But depending on how the load changes, we may only be moving 30,000 CFM, uh, you know, at, at a different set of loads, whether it be colder outside, whether that be, you know, in the evening time or overnight, for example, versus, you know, in the middle of the day when it's full blown heat, it's triple digit, whatever your conditions. So those are the two primary definitions that separate uh, what each of those are. Um, Moving into, let's talk, I want to explain more of the constant air and talk about that because the, both of these have been around for a long time and I want to really kind of paint the, def, the, the picture between them. So uh, typically your, I'm hearing myself here, let me mute that. What am I doing here? So I'm sorry, folks. I am... Hearing myself come through my speaker here. I don't know why. Technical difficulties. What is happening? Because my computer is muted. Am I hearing your end? Probably. Did you mute your? Yes. 
interesting. I can hear myself from somewhere. Anyway, that's a weird feeling, by the way. If you've never experienced that, you just randomly hear your own voice in the background. Anyway, I'll move on. Uh, so yes, um, constant air of constant, uh, your smaller tonnages are almost always going to be a constant airflow. And, you know, we were talking last week. You know, you have a twenty-ton RTU or a, a split system, a fan power box, something of that nature. Those fans are just they're just going to turn on and run, even if the unit has say a drive in it uh, we see a lot of newer modern rtus and they have vfds in them typically those vfds are doing nothing more than acting as a soft starter so, and, and 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 so when we go to commission it we end up having to commission that drive whether we run the drive to 100 percent or 60 hertz and then commission the the adjustable pulleys from there or maybe we have fixed pulleys, or maybe it's just a, um, it's not a belt driven at all. Maybe it's a direct drive. And so we can uh, adjust that drive's parameters to where it will soft start itself up to that certain point and it can be more tailored. But what's great about soft starting with a VFD is it takes all that inrush current out of the equation. And that's a big part of how those units are able to achieve their efficiency is you get that inrush current down and uh, they just it, you, you end up using a lot less energy that way. And so we can gradually bring the motor in instead of just closing a set of contacts and hammer we go. Um, so just because you see a drive in a system, especially something that's a smaller tonnage, don't assume that it's actually trying to modulate that air. It's probably just a soft starter. Uh, now, one of the things that becomes extremely critical uh, during this uh, with a, uh, a constant volume is the balancing because there's nothing else in the system that's going to adjust for any changes in that airstream. So uh, if you... If you have a constant volume system, let's say we had an air handler, and I'll get my artistic side out here today. Everybody can laugh at me in the background. I know it's okay. I got I got strong feelings. So let's say we got an air handler. We got a couple of drops coming off, hitting registers. And this is let's say just this is just comfort cooling. We're not doing anything special. We're just dealing with comfort cooling. So this is a constant volume, meaning the fan doesn't change anything. Nothing affects how the air is going to move. So when this system got commissioned, the engineer would have established, hey, I want X number of CFM at each of these drops. And then the balancing company, which you have certified balancers, would have come in and they would have made sure that each drop was moving the, uh, the CFM that it was meant to move up front. Well, Let's say each of these was 100 CFM, and the whole system is tuned just for that. Well, somewhere along the way, you know, Susie over here in this office that had this airdrop, what made Susie comfortable, now we've got Peter inside. Peter ain't so comfy. 100 CFM, he's feeling hot, for example. Let's say it's not moving enough air into it for him. He wants it colder. Okay, well, system like this, or it's, a, it's an automatic thought to just say, okay, well, I'm just going to open your damper here a little bit, and now you're going to get 150 CFM. Most of the time, it may not make that big of a difference, especially if it's just the first one or if it's just one or two that are adjusted outside of that. But what will happen and what you see is over time, Peter's just the first of many. And eventually over the years, all of these are going to start to get tweaked and adjusted and moved and set. And this system is going to be so far out of balance that none of these can get the air they need anymore. Because the whole system, as the air is moving through the main trunk, it's thrown completely, it's it's not moving where it was meant to by design and it's not able to distribute itself properly. 
So then you end up having hot zones, cold zones, and the whole space gets further and further out of comfort levels because of the improper balancing. And this is the exact scenario that leads to that. So part of my warning is be careful with a system like this because uh, if once you start messing with the balancing, it's going to hurt you. Now you'll still have, you'll still be affected in a variable volume system, but it's a lot less dramatic in my opinion, because we have the ability to uh, modulate the air depending on how a space needs it to move. And that's what makes a constant volume what it is, is everything's very specific by design. It's specced this way. The air needs to move in this cycle per this design so that everything stays comfortable. And as you adjust that, that, that air cycling is affected and everything's going to take the path the least resistance. Keep that in mind. Uh, and you also have uh, static stacking issues where you want, you know, you're going to favor the end of the static run or the, the duct run because everything's going to stack and back pressure and push. And so as you start uh, changing things over here, it's going to change how much of that static can back up and will create static to begin with. Uh, and that affects how much air can push into the rest of the system. So there's a, just, there's a lot of stuff and numbers that go into it. I'm saying a whole lot to say, be careful, please. Now, um, one, of the, uh, one of the basic designs of, okay, so let's say this system does not have VAVs, variable air volume boxes, or VAV boxes, I should say. Um, and there's a hundred different acronyms you can use for those. They all kind of sort of mostly mean the same thing. But we don't have that here. There's nothing more than a manual damper that runs to that register and dumps into the space. So how do we control whether we want to heat or cool? Because I mean, sure, we can control the, uh, we can control how much the coils flow. So say it's got a chill water coil in it. We can modulate how much flow that coil has and that's gonna affect how much our supply air is. But let's say this half of the building, let's say the air handler was in the middle and we went two different ways. So this wing was warm, but this wing was cold for any reason. Let's say the, let's say we had sunrise over here. So this is our east, sun's coming up. It's heating this side of the building. This side of the building is getting warm. This side of the building is still fairly cool. This is the other side. They're going to get hot this afternoon, and they'll get cold over here this afternoon. But right now in the morning during the, during the sunrise, they're the ones that are hot. They're the ones that are cold. So how do we, uh, how do we still control that load and make everything function? Because there is a way. It wasn't just one big system where well, you get what you got. Sorry for your luck. It's not exactly how it works. This is where we went into uh, multi-zone systems or, or decks. And this was, uh, I guess, a precursor to some of the zoning tech I would say we have today. I'm not going to act like I'm an expert on how all that played out. But in essence, I'll get rid of the fan here and let's draw some coils. So we're going to remove this and this is going to be tricky for me to draw if i'm being honest to make it make sense on your side uh without just going way too far with it let's see our coil and up here we could have our coil we're going to blank off there uh, air is going to be moving this way we're going to be pushing up and in yeah, I like how this works. Okay, let's say this is this is one zone. All right, what will happen? Uh, actually, we're going to say this is a different zone. What will happen? This is known as a multi deck. Now, what I tried to represent here was two different decks. So this would say let's let's say this is a hot water deck. Uh, this coil is a hot water coil, or it could be no coil at all, which would be referred to as a bypass or you have a chill water deck, which is your cold deck. This is where all your cold air is gonna be. There's gonna be a damper up here that are gonna be offset one another. 
So when one is closed, the other is open, and they're both always an inverse of one another. So let's say they were cold over here on this wing, which is the west wing. So as that air, as, as they need more cooling, these dampers are going to actuate, whether this could be pneumatic or DDC, to where they're going to have the warm deck air flowing to them. Now, this, zone, this area was in a different zone, okay? Now, how that would look, let me see. I'm going to draw this to where it makes some form of sense. Um, if you're looking, so this would be a side view of the air handler, per se. Let's look at a back view as if we're looking uh, from the other, like a 90 degree from the uh, air handler. So this is the base of the air handler itself. Uh, our coils are here, our deck's split. So it's your hot deck, your cold deck down here. There's a fan, there's a bunch of filters. There's a whole bunch is right there. But coming out the supply, let's just say it was a two zone setup. It's as simple as that. They, they get more complicated than that, but you would see a split in the duct like this. And you would have, uh, you know, you'd have your little actuator sitting here on both of them. Now, this actuator may be on the, on the return side, maybe on the supply side. It doesn't matter what side of the unit the actuator is on. But when you walk in and you see, you'll see a seam in the middle of that duct is what you will see. And what will happen is this seam will tie up into this zone and this seam will hit the other zone that goes the other direction. And so basically here at the air handler, these two zones are going to split and go this way. Um, so this would be a straight on view and how the zone gets separated. You still have just the open supply cabinet that all the air is getting pushed into, but they have a completely different air stream. And depending on which one of these dampers is open depends on whether this is cold air coming out or hot air. This would be a multi-zone. So this is how this deck over here, so this zone, let's say it was uh, this side, this particular one, we could have our cold air coming from the chill water uh, open. So this damper would be open, feeding out to keep them cool. While at the same time, this other zone here on the left would be feeding this wing of the building, and it could be sending out warm air to keep them warm to make the whole building balance at an equal temperature. And all of this is with a constant flow of air. We never change, because remember, as these actuators, they're usually linked together on the same linkage, or actually the same uh, shaft, if I, sh I should say. And so as they rotate, you know, if they're both at 50%, that means you're getting half of each deck at the same time. So they're always working with the inverse of each other. So throughout that whole time frame, our CFM through that zone never changes. And like I said, this may not be uh, a, a hot water coil at all. This may just be an air bypass. You may have a remote hot water coil or electric heater or something else up here in the ductwork. And so that's what's going to heat when it needs it. And when it doesn't need it, it's just going to flow um, through the bypass deck. And that way, that is technically more efficient because then you're not having to neutralize hot and cold against each other, which is what a true hot and a true cold deck have to do. They have to neutralize each other's air when the space is... Anyway, I could spend way too much time just talking about that. I'm trying to be cautious of that. Uh, whoop. That was weird. Okay, we have some weird stuff going on today, fellas, I tell you. Okay, we're going to move on. Hot deck, cold deck, talked about it all. Let's move into VAVs, or variable air volume systems. I don't know why I'm erasing everything I just drew. I'm going to have to redraw most of it, but we'll just go with it. Anybody ever have those days where you just kind of, you go with the flow and you realize you undid everything you need to redo anyway? Kind of one of those days. We'll just, we'll keep rolling. Large tonnage systems are typically the ones that you'll have a variable air control. 
This could be large RTUs. Intellipacks are a prime example of this. The Carrier 50 series uh, are examples of this. Um, Daikin has their own uh, versions. I mean, actually, Daikin, uh, Daikin will do this with actually some pretty small tonnages. They're one of the few where I've seen they've had like 20 ton systems doing um, uh, some, some basic VAV stuff. It's pretty interesting. Anyway, uh, point is, it's usually going to be your larger tonnages, and most of your modern equipment is going to have some sort of VAV or variable air volume control. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say VAV a lot. I, I'm trying to be careful separating what we call a VAV box, which is what controls the air in the space, and we'll get to all that and yada yada. Um, so, how did the original, because they still exist. We, there, are, there are plenty of buildings, at least in my area, uh, or our area, where we deal with uh, the OG style, which is IGV. If you've never heard that, inlet guide vein. Now, if you ever do any kind of study on centrifugal stuff, you'll find that term also pops up there. Uh, if you didn't know, squirrel cages inside of an air handler or an RTU uh, use the same centrifugal laws in theory that a centrifugal chiller does, like a water-cooled, big, massive thing that most of us are terrified to even look at, much less touch. It's the same base technology. Everything, they're, they're, they're using the same principles. So with that, um, we also have some of the same components. So we have an inlet guide vein. Now, if you have no idea what that is, just imagine you had a squirrel cage, my also lovely squirrel cage here. Uh, and in that, you know, you've got your inner inlet uh, squirrels spinning around doing their thing in there. We would have these louvers that are kind of um, triangular shaped, if you will. So these louvers would be attached to a linkage and they would be on both sides of the blower housing. And they would have this linkage ring that goes all the way around. And you'd have uh, an actuator sitting over here to the side that turns these one way or the other and those, those louvers open and close. Uh, if you ever, it, uh, when, I, when I first started working on McQuay's uh, self-contains, they, they took me a little while to figure out why is this thing always clicking? Every time I walk up to it, I hear this click, click, click. It never stops. It took me forever. And granted, I didn't really know what I was looking at at the time. But I finally realized the clicking was the static control function. So they're using what would be a floating point actuator to send 24 volts clockwise, 24 volts counterclockwise, or maybe what is, is trying to control static control. So in a variable air volume system, we're trying to, to control a set output pressure on the supply duct at all times. And that plays into the boxes that control the airstream downstream. And I'll get into that more here in a bit. But uh, essentially we want one inch of static. That is our set point, kind of a default. It can be as much as an inch and a half. I've seen buildings run even more than that. While I don't recommend it, uh, it, it does happen. Anyway, let's say it's an inch to inch and a half, doesn't matter which. Uh, we're going to open and close these louvers. These are just big old uh, sheets of, just big old sheet metal panels that are mounted to the side of the blower housing. And those can open and close to just block off air. That's all it's doing. It's just putting a stranglehold on the blower and you're only gonna be able to move this amount of air. And by doing that, we can adjust how many CFM that blower is able to move without ever adjusting the speed of the blower itself. It's able to maintain a constant inlet line of 60 hertz. You know, typically those motors are on just a hard XL start anyway. Uh, maybe you've got a, 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 a wide delta start on something like that, but typically it's just, it's just an XL. You get contact or hits, it goes. So, uh, this is how we turn that constant volume system into a variable. And uh, most of our modern systems, we, we're going in and we're putting in uh, v, VFDs 
or they come shipped with VFDs out the box. You know, that's been that way for quite some time. I, I don't know when the last time IGVs in the guide vanes got shipped inside of a unit. I do know it's been a really long time because I've seen it in RTUs, so train especially was one. I've seen them use guide vanes in those. Um, uh, they're old, actually the older Voyagers. Uh, we've got a, we've actually still have some in service, some old Voyagers that were using IGVs. We've ran into several of them that uh, have been converted. Uh, so they had IGVs. They didn't pull the assembly. They just unwired the actuator control and they installed a VFD in, the, in this particular one I'm thinking of in the return cabinet to where that was what controlled the motor speed based off of static instead of the, the uh, guide vane. Anyway, that's what a lot of, so what we would do is we would do a, a guide vane lockdown, if you will. We go in, we pull the control function, and then we just, by whatever means necessary, we lock that vane down to where it just stays 100% open all the time. Uh, that way it's, it doesn't have any effect on it. And then the VFD can take over control of how much you speed up and slow down. Now, I, what I pointed out earlier was known as a floating point control. So uh, this will be a quick side note I really didn't plan on talking about. But um, there's two ways to control uh, airflow in a lot of these systems. You can either do... Uh, f um, uh, digital input, which would be, you know, typically zero to 10 volts DC uh, going to it. Uh, actuators can run off of that. You could also do a four to 20 milliamps, the, the two uh, most common modern ways. But if you have an older system that you want to convert to uh, a VFD and you don't have an automation system that can come along and give it a supply fan command, uh, or, or a reference, a supply reference for speed, then uh, and say, let's say that older unit used a floating point. So by floating point, real quick definition, it wants to create more airflow. So it's gonna send 24 volts to the clockwise input on the actuator, for example. So it's gonna send that for two seconds. As it turns clockwise, the veins open, more air moves moves too much air, needs to do less airflow, does the inverse. Sends 24 volts to the counterclockwise and rotates counterclockwise, veins close, less air. That's what floating point is doing. So what we can do is we can take that floating point command and give that to a VFD. And you can program a VFD to function off of a floating uh, point input. Now, you have to be careful with uh, the, the, is how the, the floating point PIDs are programmed. Most of the time, those are going to start when the motor first turns on. That's going to start with the motor in, uh, or the guide vanes at full zero. They're fully closed. So you want to make sure that you take that into account when you're programming your drive and you're setting your minimum VFD speed. And then from there, yeah, the drive just, if it gets input on uh, DO1, that means speed up. And input on DO2, 24 volts, DO, what am I saying? <sighs> DI, digital input. When you get input on your digital input one or two, it's going to know to speed up or slow down. I'll, I'll get there. I'm sorry. I promise. Okay. Uh, See, so that's a lockdown, and that's your, that's your basic static control strategy. Uh, with static control, uh, we have, uh, you can think of it like this. Your load is going to uh, be represented, usually, by the, um, uh, by the reference being sent to the drive, for example. And we're moving forward, I'm gonna talk about it from a drive perspective because at this stage, over 90% of what we work on has drives. There's very little of the uh, guide vane systems out there anymore. So, uh, yes, when our drive is running slow, let's say 40 hertz or less, then we know we've got a fairly low load because it's not taking that much fan speed 
in order to satisfy our supply set point. Now, other things can go wrong here, but I'm just talking in a general sense of how it should function when everything is functioning. Uh, if we <clears throat> something to keep in mind, we're talking about how we're controlling the supply air throughout this whole process. What we haven't talked about is how the equipment is keeping that air cool. So we're, we're, you know, we all agree we have to be careful when we increase or decrease air because if we decrease air too much, what are we going to do? We're going to start slugging compressors. We're going to start losing equipment. Bad stuff's going to happen. Uh, and in a commercial building, it's, it's not like you got a Y1, Y2 multi-stage thermostat. No, you've got a control system. And most of the time, you know, that control system hardly ever talks to the actual equipment. The most it may ever do is tell it to turn on, please. That's about it, you know, at, at its basic level. Sure, it can do more on, on modern stuff, and they're trying to do that. Uh, you know, our control side is getting deeper and deeper into system integration, where they actually fully integrate the unit into the automation system. But that's a fairly complicated thing, or at least it can be. So anyway, um, the unit itself cares about what is my leaving air temperature. So when it's deciding how many compressors or how far open do I let my chill water valve open, it's all based off of supply air. Now, obviously, as we reduce the amount of air flowing through the system, it's easier to achieve that supplier set point for us, that's usually gonna mean a 55 degree set point. So because it's easier, that means we either need less compressors to do so, or we just need to have less chill water valve. Because if we overfeed the chill water valve, I mean, why not just run that 100% open all the time? Well, that, that messes with the rest of the equipment. Chillers don't appreciate having too cold a water coming back, I can assure you. They, they, they will let you know that is not okay in their book. So, uh, we have, to be, we have to pay attention to how much we're flowing in order to have the most efficient control. Because a lot of it, you know, I'm talking about the chiller and being funny about it, but in reality, it all comes back to efficiency as well. The more we can allow stuff to turn down, the more efficient we can become. We have a question online. Yes, sir. Why do we use a dryer filter centrifugal chiller? A filter dryer on a centrifugal? Mm -hmm. uh, slightly off topic, but uh, same reason we would use it on any system. Uh, they, they get, they can get contaminants and little things can happen. And so our main objective is whatever gets in there, we clean it. Uh, it's, it's, it's why we use filters in general. Uh, centrifugals are not exempt from that condition. Um, so yes, we're trying to achieve the most efficiency we can. So by achieving that efficiency, we can flow less water, which puts less load on the pumps. Maybe we can even slow the pumps down. We don't have to run the chillers as hard. And the, the fan itself is able to slow down and pull less amps. And just everything becomes more efficient. It's just, it, that's what it is. That's, that's the whole purpose behind it. So supplier temp is the control for the cooling equipment but we're honing in on the air side. So I don't want to, the, the two aren't completely independent of each other. You know, the supply air heavily affects the, um, uh, the actual staging of the system. And something you have to be really careful of is that supply air pickup. So uh, whether that's the equipment itself or the automation system, either or that's monitoring, what's my static pressure? Uh, so, so that should be, give or, you know, by rules of thumb, three quarters of the way down the duct run after a 90. And part of what you're trying to be careful of is there's a whole lot of turbulence that comes off of this fan and hits this duct. And if you put that static too close to the duct, you know, let's say, or too close to the fan, I mean, uh, that can, let's say it's over here. Well, it may be easy to achieve a one inch static right here, but by the time we actually go another 
300 feet down the duct and then we hit our taps, we may be down to half an inch of static over here, right? Now, dramatic examples, but you get my point, is we're not gonna feed enough air to the end of it. And so what we've agreed to as an industry is if we can achieve three quarters of the way down our static set point, there's gonna be some version of that in between. It may not be a perfect one inch, but it'll be close enough that the system will be able to run in a balanced state and it'll function like we want it to. And that's really important for a VAV box. And uh, we're doing pretty good on time, so I will be able to get into that and why that's so important. Uh, and after the 90 is important because of the, the turbulence. There is a lot of just velocity turbulence that gets generated when you're in a straight shot of the fan. And there can be a lot of force right there. So part of what we're trying to do is we wanna catch a turn, which really helps kind of neutralize some of those fan turbulences and just creates what would be normal turbulence. You know, maybe that's not a, the best explanation in the world. Somebody else is more than welcome to phrase it their own way, but it gives us a more accurate reading. And that is the ultimate point because a static, you know, a, a, a pickup. Now I call it a pedo tube. I still stand behind the term, uh, but I got a lot of flack for it last time. Anyway, a static pickup will have a little, uh, this will be like a little aluminum tube that sits inside the duct. And it should have a 90 degree turn to where it's facing away from the airflow. Now I have seen some from the uh, automation supply houses where it doesn't 90 at all. It's just a straight tube stuck in the duct. Personally, I'm not, really a fan of that because what you can do is you can pick up other pressures like total pressure and so your static pressure will be influenced by things it shouldn't be influenced by which is why we put it all the way the heck down here to begin with because as that turbulence is moving uh, there can be little whips of air that kick back and just slightly pressurize that tip of the um, that tip of that that tube that we're trying to measure static pressure with which static pressure is just the literal PSI output or pressure against the sides of the duct. That is static pressure. We measure it in inches of water column because if I remember right, it was at 14 PSI, I'm sorry, 14 inches of, wa of water column for every PSI. Somebody fact check me on that. Um, so, Anyway, as, as that air, if we were over here, is moving through there, that turbulence will absolutely mess with that reading. And that's part of what we're trying to avoid is we want, it's not gonna be perfect, but we want as pure of a reading as we can achieve. So saying a whole lot to say, three quarters of the way down, ideally after a 90, have a pickup that is what has some kind of 90 degree turn or, or can specifically look away from the airstream. You know, we don't want this to be facing towards the fan. We want our pickup to be facing away from the fan in some possible way. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. So going back to the load thing. Uh, typically, when I'm doing system measurements, I will, uh, I'll, I'll look at what my fan is running because how fast my fan is running does help me determine how much load I'm actually putting into the system. Now, I've, you could also include things like, okay, what's your return air temp? What's your return humidity? You know, there's other things you can pay attention to that indicate the load. And while those are valid, you can have a warmer return, but still not be moving a whole lot of air. So it, it doesn't matter how warm your return is if the CFM ain't there. I mean, it has an impact obviously, but it's not enough. So it, that's a part of that equation that we, I try to factor into when I'm looking at a system. And so what I'm trying to monitor is if I see that my supply, my supply uh, fan is only running say 30 to 40 Hertz. I know that I've got a fairly low load 
And I should expect that in the readings I get on the system. I'm going to be running a lower uh, suction saturation, usually. I'm going to be uh, running a lower superheat than normal. My uh, subcooling, my head pressure, just all the way across the board, things are going to be lower because there's not as much load being inputted, even if there's one compressor running by itself. Uh, now, we could get into a whole refrigeration principles if I continue with that thought. But the point is, you know, that's going to have a major impact in my readings. So understand that from the airflow side. Now, if I see my system, my fan is running 50 hertz or more, then I know that I've got a much greater load on my system and I can, uh, uh, I can expect that in my readings. And more than expect that, I would also expect to see more of the system staged on or trying to capture that load. So that fan speed can really help you. And even if it's a guide vane system, even just peeking in the door, and you can't literally just open the door and look at it because you throw the whole static control off and whatever position it's in, it ain't going to stay in for very long because you're bypassing the coil at that point. But uh, if you just were to peek in real quick just to get a glimpse of what position, what physical position those veins are in, uh, sometimes you have a feedback from the actuator. A lot of times you don't. Anyway, that... You can also use that. The more you see those veins are open, it's just like looking and seeing 50 hertz on, this, on the VFD, right? If those veins are dang near closed off because it's trying to choke the air down to maintain, uh, then that means you, you don't have that much load. So the VAVs themselves down, um, downstream are not open. The boxes themselves. Uh, and something else to be prepared for is if you've got a system, you ran a service call and the system was down and now you've got, a, you've got it fixed, right? Whatever it was. Maybe it was a condenser fan motor, doesn't matter. But it caused, you had to either turn the power off or you had to uh, shut down or the fan tripped out and had to shut down as well. You should expect that that fan will likely run to 100% to do two things. One, it needs to get enough air to the boxes inside to allow them to start closing back down again. Because a lot of the time, that unit's fan isn't designed to run with the airstream 100% open, which is what a VAV will do trying to make its set point. Because a VAV box has a separate controller making its own decisions that isn't communicating usually you know, with the actual air handler or the RTU. If it does communicate, it's pretty minimal. So they're not always on the same page. So all your boxes are wide open. So you got to get air to the boxes so they see CFM flowing again so they then can close back down. So in that process, that fan's going to fly out the wazoo and it's going to run like that for several minutes until everything can calm back down. Um, and then you'll see your, your fan speed start to settle out. The other thing that can cause that is if you have a really high load in the space and all those boxes are hot and so they're asking for a lot more air or their maximum set points, you know, it may take a while for that unit to cool that whole space down enough to allow those boxes to even start closing down. Because remember, if, if all of them are needing their maximum flow set point and that's pushed them to be wide open and that, art, that fan wasn't designed for the whole duct system to run wide open, then don't be surprised if, if it has to run like that for a half an hour or better before everything cools down enough. So something to, to keep in mind. Uh, all right, moving on. VAV boxes. There's all kinds of versions of these. You also hear fan power box. Uh, they, they, they mean one of the same thing, uh, but they are different. You also have what's known as a series fan power. You also have a parallel fan power. We're not getting, that, that could be a whole class. So what I'm focusing in on is the damper itself. We're going to pay attention to that. Whether there's a fan installed or not, that damper is controlling the amount of CFM it's allowed to flow. Uh, per manufacturer designs, the, you need to have a minimum 
one inch of static coming into the damper itself in order for that damper to maintain its CFM design properly. Now this is where all this static stuff becomes really important because there will be a set of uh, pickups inside of the, in, uh, the inlet of the VAV. So this is where you'll have, I'm sure most would consider this a true pedo, uh, and we're not talking about the other kind of pedos. Anyway, uh, <laughs> sorry, you'll, you'll, have, uh, you'll have two different sets of pickups inside of the duct, right? So let's imagine there's, a, a, say it's a 10 inch duct and you've got this ring or cross assembly. So let's say one of these is gonna be marked as your high pressure. Now we're talking inches of water. The other ring may be your low pressure. So if air is moving this way, uh, coming into it, then the high pressure uh, holes, this red cross would have little tiny holes that are looking directly at the airstream. And that is picking up what is known as system total pressure, TP. The blue ring, would have holes on the other side that are facing the damper. So it's facing away from the airstream, and those are picking up the actual static pressure, the physical static when it's coming into the VAV box. That is referred to as just static pressure. In order for this box to decide how many CFM it's moving, it knows what size duct it is. And there is a generic uh, VAV duct chart you can pull up. Uh, and and it's the, the math is the same despite the manufacturer. But in that chart, what they're doing is they're taking total pressure and the, the static pressure and subtracting them from each other to get velocity pressure. Uh, all of this is just so that we can calculate actual CFM. That's the whole point. So we can take velocity pressure and so we already established we have a 10 inch duct. So we can compare that 10 inch duct size to the velocity pressure. I should have had a chart pulled up. That would have been a fantastic time to show you that. Uh, that's just not occurring to me. Anyway, um, we, can, we can take that and we, that'll give us a physical CFM reading. And we, can, we know exactly, you know, we've got 300 CFM moving through this damper right now. And as that damper closes uh, and opens, obviously this deferential will, will fluctuate, which means this will change. And that will affect how much air is physically moving. So if uh, memory serves, the wider the deferential, the, the, the higher the number on the, on the velocity pressure, the more physical movement you have, the more CFM we're going. The lower that, the less. Now, there's a handful of styles. Some of them are truly just crosses. Some of them are, it's a two circles side by side. One's got holes this way, one that way. If, uh, if memory serves, if you look at the side of the, of the duct, I'm trying to, I want to use more of my colors. So I'm going to go with black this time. If you look at the side of the duct, we'll have two little uh, pickup ports with some uh, nylon tubes sticking out of it or, I'm sorry, these will usually be like aluminum or plastic and you'll have your nylon tubing running to it. Your top port is usually your high pressure uh, or your total pressure, I mean, uh, reading. Or if you're looking at a, a VAV controller, it'll be the positive reading. Uh, the, the lower one will be your static pressure or your low pressure and it'll be represented in some, in some cases as the negative pressure on the VAV controller. So when you go and you hook, you're looking at how things are hooked up, because I see these are backwards all the time, you can verify which is which with a manometer um, without having to tear everything apart. Just hook your manometer up. The higher of the two readings when the damper is open, that's your total pressure. About all there is to it. So uh, this is gonna screw up that VAV's ability to control completely. Uh, but what makes the VAV want to open to begin with? 
In short, it's all based off of how far from set point are we. So VAVs, the way they're usually programmed, because remember, efficiency, could we brute force things to where we say, okay, we're above set point, we're going to just throw our damper open and slam it. Okay, we could, but that's not very efficient. You're going to have trouble uh, controlling that. So um, what we can also do and, and what we typically do is we want to gradually open and close and modulate that CFM based off of how far from set point are we. So the further we get from that 70 degree set point, the more CFM we're going to put in that space. And our goal is to gradually capture the load and then slowly bring it down to where we don't have any swings because the more swing you have, the less efficient your system is operating. Uh, so yeah, uh, you know, the controls system will typically have a minimum and maximum set point on a box. The maximum is usually configured by the engineer that designed the system. You know, he will just declare that you're only going to be allowed to uh, open the box or you, you should only have this much CFM moving through it uh, per my design. So that is where that number should come from is the engineered drawings. I find that actual practice, they a lot of times don't. Anyway, uh, the minimum CFM should also come from the engineer's drawings. He, he'll have in his uh, mechanical schedule you know, this is your minimum CFM going through this particular uh, VAV or, or uh, fan power, whatever it is. So the reason we have a minimum, so when these things satisfy, they make set point, you know, we wanted 70 degrees and we're there, or say we go past it down to 69. We're not going to just completely close the damper, and we shouldn't, not in a commercial space, because we still have to have air exchange. So if we completely shut the damper down, then the outside air we need to keep that space from getting stale and to keep our CO2 levels down isn't going to get there. So we, we run a minimum flow set point to maintain outside air exchange for, CF, for CO2 control. So just bear that in mind. Uh, that's, a, that's a call I have gotten from some. It will, you know, I'm at set point, but my damper is still open. It's probably even in heating mode, like you'll walk up, say it's a fan power, it's in heating mode and you're trying to push hot air into the space. Uh, you say you got electric heaters on it and the whole, every one of them are turned on, but your, your supply damper, which is pushing 55 degrees uh, supply air into the, into the unit, uh, it's still open, you know, 10%. Well, that's the minimum uh, supply air and you, that, that's, that's necessary. Uh, and that pretty well covers most of what I had to talk about. I feel good. I got all that off my chest. I like it. Appreciate y'all listening. It's a good therapy for me every once in a while. Anyway, for anybody who is interested, uh, these trainings are for our in-house team. Everybody else, you know, you're welcome to get the benefit from it. Uh, but our team here at Air Performance of Central Texas is who we tailor these to. So we have a training committee, we have a whole process we go through in deciding what we talk about, how we talk about it. And you know, a lot of what I'm building in terms of these trainings is tailored to what I see our team needs, the questions I get from them and what they're really looking for. I have room and availability inside of that team. We are hiring at multiple levels across the board, anywhere from projects to apprentices to technicians. So if you're interested in that, uh, APS, uh, APS-CentralTX.com should have like a join our team uh, link or something like that. You're also welcome to email me your resume. Um, if you send it to me directly, I will warn you up front. I am extremely busy. It takes me a while to get to some of those things. Uh, I do have things in my email that I prioritize. So if you send that and you don't hear much for a while, that's why, I'm sorry, but uh, don't give up. Send it through, send, if you go through our website, HR takes over and HR is real good about making sure I do my job. So 
she'll take care of you so that I take care of us and we'll all be good. <sighs> I feel pretty good. I've rambled enough. Yep. We cover everything. We got any questions? No questions. No, no questions. Uh, I'll see y'all later. Y'all have a good one. Reach out if you need anything. <laughs>